I'm concerned with science and religion. It's what my job is in the University of Cambridge to teach on the interface of science and religion. So I'm endlessly fascinated by how people approach that. And it was something that concerned Rudolf Steiner, I think, from quite an early stage. And uh, this growing divorce in the late 19th century um, between science and religion. And I think the distinctive thing about Steiner's approach to that is to want to find some scientific approach to religious and spiritual questions. There are different ways of bringing science and religion into dialogue, but I think that's what's distinctive, to approach, um, um, I think he would say, the spiritual rather than the religious, but to approach the spiritual in a scientific way. He used the phrase spiritual science, didn't he? Yes, he did. Do you think that's a helpful phrase, then? I think, it's, um, I think it's probably a phrase that works better in German than it does in English. And uh, um, spiritual has a much broader sense in German than I think it does in English. And so it doesn't translate very well, I think. I mean, there are many people who feel that these mysteries that, as it were, religion deals with, simply yeah. can't be approached scientifically. It isn't appropriate. Yes, yes. I mean, what do you feel about that? Um, it's always helpful to have complementary perspectives, I think. So um, I'm often skeptical of the idea that science can give an exhaustive account of something that's happening spiritually, but I think it does have a useful contribution to make. But there are other perspectives as well. So, for example, I've been, I've been doing some work on spiritual healing recently, and I think there's a very helpful scientific perspective on that. I think you can get some handhold on how spiritual, spiritual healing might be mediated through immunological processes and so on. But I don't think that exhausts what there is to say about spiritual healing. I think there are also more distinctively religious things to be said about it as well. Why, why is Steiner not better known, do you think? It's an interesting question why Steiner isn't better known. I think there are various reasons. Um, there's something off-putting about his writings. I think that that has to be said. What style, you mean? Yes, yes, yes. Style and content, I think. And, and also something off-putting about the society, the kind of following that he has sometimes built up around him, which can look rather too cult-like from the outside. Yeah. Not at all what he wanted, I think, but it can look like that. Yeah. What, what do you mean by off-putting in terms of his writings? What's off-putting? Well, it's... Um, there are two kinds of writings, of course, his books and the, and the edited lectures, and I think different problems with them. I think the lectures are just um, transcripts, and transcripts of any, any lectures are a little bit... Um, um, rambling, I think. They are a response to the occasion of the moment. I'm sure there were occasions when he was responding to things in his audience at the time, but which don't translate all that well into a, into a script, and there was no revision of those. He didn't have the opportunity to revise those. So I think there are problems about those lectures, but also, also different problems about the books that... Um, come from the period when he was secretary of the German section of the Theosophical Society and um, I think are, are too imbued with theosophy to be appealing to most people. And yet the theosophists were the first people who were seriously interested in what he had to say. And Yes, it's right that the theosophists were the first people who were interested in what he had to say, and they came to him, and it was an invitation that he responded to. But I, but I think he was always ambivalent about that, and he himself had been quite put off by theosophy in early periods of his life. So I don't think it was entirely welcome invitation, the, the one he received from the theosophists, and I think he accepted it with some ambivalence and with quite a keen awareness of the dangers. But that, in a sense, also set the tone for what followed and what then became what he called anthroposophy, didn't it? Yes, it did. But I think, I think there was a change in tone when he ceased to be in, in, uh, associated with the Theosophical Society and the Anthroposophical Society was born. And what comes afterwards seems to me much more distinctively Schleiner, much more original, and actually, for me, much more appealing. 
you've you've used the word unique about Stein. I mean, would you mm. like to? Yeah, what do you? Yes. He's unique, I mean, partly in his spiritual gifts. I think he clearly has exceptional powers. Because they're so unusual, it's hard to know quite how to characterize those, but he's clearly some kind of clairvoyant. And he's unusually disciplined and highly trained in the way he uses those clairvoyant powers. And he has such a serious sense of purpose um, to um, leave the world a better place as a result of his mission. And arising out of that, all this great outpouring of practical activity. And I don't know of anyone else who, who um, spans all those things, really, has the exceptional powers, is so disciplined with them, so purposeful and so practical. I think that's a unique contribution. And very moral, too, wasn't he? Oh, absolutely, yes. I, I mean, I was including that with his purposefulness, really. I mean, it was a deep sense of moral purpose that Schneider had. Yeah, yeah. Fraser, what about um, the figure of, of Christ? I mean, that uh, was absolutely central to what uh, Steiner, underpinned Steiner's yes. work, wasn't it, gradually? Yes, Christ is central for Steiner, and he left the Theosophists over, over Christ, really. And um, it arises out of, out of this deep festival of knowledge that was clearly a very formative experience for him when he became aware that the mystery of Golgotha had had an absolutely central place in the evolution of human consciousness. And for him, that was probably one of the deepest spiritual experiences of his life, I think, something, something absolutely central, very immediate, not a matter of accepting doctrine. I mean, I think, I think he was really converted to Christianity by this, as he calls it, festival of knowledge that seems to have gone on over, over some months. It's not a sectarian understanding of Christ, so I think he's, he's not wanting to associate Christ too closely with the Christian church. I mean, I think the Christian church, sadly, is all too sectarian sometimes. Um, for Steiner, it's, um, it's a strong view of how humanity as a whole is transformed by Christ. I mean, some people understand that more than others and perhaps open themselves to it, but it's essentially a transformation of humanity as a whole. He's a very strong universalist. I mean, there's always been a debate within Christians about universalist particularists. Steiner's a very strong universalist. He's also very strongly objectivist. And I think this sometimes comes to a, as a surprise to people. There's been quite a big tendency in the 20th century to... Um, to do a retreat to some kind of subjective or existential understanding of Christianity. But Steiner is absolutely in going in the opposite direction. For him, it is just an objective fact that the um, evolution of human consciousness was changed by Christ. I mean, take it or leave it. I mean, and even if no one had known about that, even if there had never been anyone of Christian faith, for Steiner, I think that transformation of human consciousness would still have happened as a result of the work of Christ. Does that mean it's not to do with the religion, finally, then, for Steiner? That's right. That's right. It is, it is really just an objective fact about the evolution of human consciousness and the impact of Christ on that. Though there's a role for religious activity. I mean, of course, he's, he's deeply interested in the role of meditation, and that was absolutely central for the spiritual path that he taught. But also, he was, he was asked to find, to find a kind of Christian community, asked to give advice on how the sacrament should be conducted. So he saw a role for that, but it was, it was um, for him... Um, not not the essential significance of Christ. I mean, I, I think the, um, the impact of Christ was in no way dependent on people participating in the Eucharist, the act of consecration of man, as he called it. Yeah. I think Steiner has in some ways a fairly orthodox understanding of the incarnation and in that Christ was um, a great spiritual being who, who became incarnate 
Um, he has his own distinctive way of understanding what spiritual being that was. But I've always found it more, more helpful to put the emphasis on the, on the impact of um, Christ on humanity. And there I find um, Owen Barfield particularly helpful in um, elaborating the kind of change in direction of human consciousness that came about as a result of Christ, that there was an earlier period in which humanity had felt that the spiritual world was sort of talking, talking to them through nature. But then there was another period that connects with what's spoken of in the New Testament about the gift of the Spirit, where humanity has the opportunity to look out at nature with a spirit-imbued consciousness, a completely different um, direction in which the spirit is flowing um, from inwards outwards, rather than in the old animistic way, from outwards inwards. And the task for the future then, what was Steiner um, emphasizing then in relation to that consciousness? The task of humanity is to carry forward that evolution of consciousness, and it's a slightly different task in different eras and epochs. And Steiner has a very strong, elaborate view of the evolution of human consciousness and the particular opportunities and dangers that there are in each particular period. So it's, it, it is always quite particular to where we have got to. And interesting, I think, that there are always both dangers and opportunities. Um, quite how to respond to them depends on, on, on where we are in the evolution of consciousness at any particular time. But it's always a kind of deepening of consciousness and in our own period the um, development of the imagination is a very important part of that. It, it had been influential with Steiner, I think, that he'd, um, he'd been part of the team that edited Goethe's scientific writings when he was a younger man. And that Goethean stream of science, I think, had entered deeply into him. Um, and it, it illustrates the kind of cultivation of imagination with which he was always concerned. Goethe, for example, had studied the um, forms of plants and had this idea that you could really understand plant morphology by meditating deeply on, for example, the changing structure of, and shape of leaves until you could hold that so much in your mind that you had really understood it. It was a kind of deeply meditative um, way of studying plant morphology. And I think it illustrates the kind of cultivation of imagination with which Steiner was concerned. That certainly underpins Waldorf education, doesn't yes. it? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Would you like to say something a little bit more about these, these, these practical, the practical initiatives that have come out of, of Steiner's work? Because, mm. I mean, mm. that, that's pretty yes. unique in terms yes. of, you know, philosophy, yes. isn't it? Yes. Um, it is very striking with Steiner, I think, that there is this man of unique spiritual gifts and great intellect, but whose f focus is, in the end, very largely on practical activities. And I think it's the practical activities that, in a, in a way, most distinctive. And, and it's an almost complete alternative culture, all founded on spiritual principles in a very systematic way. And I really don't know of anyone else who's done that. I mean, there are Steiner ways of doing medicine and architecture and agriculture and education and so many things. It's remarkably comprehensive. There are dangers, of course, aren't there, that it can become a, um, a rigid and fixed. Yes. There are always dangers with that kind of initiative that it can become rigid and fixed. And it's important, I think, for people involved in all of those areas of activity to kind of take the indications that Steiner gave and to continue to develop them, um, drawing on their own spiritual resources and relating to the context in which they find themselves. And it's now the 150th anniversary of, of Steiner's birth, and things have moved on. Our context is not quite his context. So it seems to me important to use increasingly flexibly the insights that he gave. 
Um, I suppose the challenge with Steiner is to find ways of bringing what I think is his remarkable contribution more into mainstream life. Um, he's very largely neglected in academic circles and I can understand the reasons for that, but I still think he's a very interesting and important thinker, and I'd like to find ways in which he could be brought more into, in, into academic study. I'd also like to see ways in which his practical initiatives can become integrated into the ordinary fabric of society more than they have been. I mean, he has been rather too much a kind of specialist, almost cult figure for a small minority. But um, there's nothing new about this. I think in many ways that was a problem that he faced in his own lifetime. And he was almost 40 before he found any significant audience for the things he wanted to say. And there were always problems, I think, in finding an appropriate audience. And the audience he did find, largely growing out of the Theosophical Society, were perhaps looking for slightly different things than he wanted to give. I think there was always something of attention there. What were they looking for? Well, I think... I think those early members of the Theosophical Society were looking for a wisdom teacher who would tell them how things were. And Steiner could do that, but he was also someone who developed this philosophy of freedom, philosophy of spiritual activity, and as he so often emphasized, didn't want people to accept things simply because he told them they were so, but wanted to explore things for themselves, to find their own path. Um, so I think there was, um, there was quite a disjunction between the kind of great leader that his followers were looking for and the kind of leader that he wanted to be. A very non-authoritarian leader, I think, is what he believed in being. That's what he thought was appropriate for the modern times in which he was living. I think there may have been sometimes um, a slightly controlling aspect to his personality that was at variance with what he thought was appropriate and necessary, but on the whole, it's what he thought was necessary that won through rather than his sometimes controlling instincts. <laughs>